regulating the bottled water industry. We'll hear about the differences in regulation between bottled water and tap water. Bart Stupak of Michigan chairs the Commerce Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations. This is an hour, 50 minutes. This meeting will come to order. Today we have a hearing titled Regulation of Bottled Water. The chairman, the ranking member, and chairman emeritus will be recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Other members of the subcommittee will be recognized for a three-minute opening statement. I will begin. Food safety is an extremely important issue that this committee has held nearly a dozen hearings on over the past two years. Time and again, we hear from individuals who want more information so they can make wise decisions about what they eat and drink. My constituents are no exception. Today's hearing on bottled water hits close to home. My vastly rural district in northern Michigan contains more shoreline than any other congressional district except Alaska, and we have a keen awareness of water quality issues. Michigan is also home to a large bottled water facility in Macosta County that has not been without controversy over the years. In 2008, Americans consumed 8.6 billion gallons of bottled water. Bottled water is a billion dollar a year industry with sales up more than 83% this decade. Many Americans believe that the water they drink from a bottle is healthier than the water that comes from their faucets. The Water Research Foundation found that nearly 56% of bottled water drinkers cite health and safety as the primary reason they choose bottled water over tap water. As a result, Americans are willing to pay top dollar for bottled water, which costs up to 1,900 times more than tap water and uses up to 2,000 times more energy to produce and deliver. Over the past several years, however, bottled water has been recalled due to contamination by arsenic, bromate, cleaning compounds, mold, and bacteria. In April, a dozen students at a California junior high school reportedly were sickened after drinking bottled water from a vending machine. Consumers may not realize, but that many of the regulations that apply to municipalities responsible for tap water do not apply to companies that produce bottled water. I'd like to put up a chart that outlines some of these differences. For example, municipal tap water suppliers are required to tell their consumers within 24 hours if they find dangerous contaminants that exceed federal levels, but this requirement does not apply to bottled water companies. Certified laboratories must be used to test tap water, but bottled water has no similar requirement. Tap water suppliers provide their consumers, customers with annual consumer confidence report that detail the sources of their water, any contamination found, the likely cause of contamination, and any potential health effects. Bottled water distributors are not required to provide this report to consumers. Instead, Bottled water consumers rely on limited information found on labels and, in some cases, on company websites. Some companies exacerbate this problem by exaggerating claims about the health benefits of their products. For example, Poland Springs explains the history of its water by saying, when Joseph Ricker was revived from his deathbed, reputedly by drinking the spring's water, and lived another 52 years, the water's health benefits became legendary. Mountain Valley Water Company provides similar accounts of its water, stating, clinical tests at hospitals in New York, St. Louis, and Philadelphia demonstrated improvements in the health of patients suffering from kidney and liver disorders and, rheumat and rheumatism as a result of drinking Mountain Valley water. Aquamantra, spring water, explains that the words written on its labels, mantras such as, I am healthy, and I am loved, permeate the liquid influencing the taste and beneficial properties of water. The company also claims that Aquamantra uses the design of its label to affect the molecular structure of the water. Today the subcommittee will receive two new reports that raise questions about why the regulations governing bottled water are weaker than those governing tap water, as well as widespread public perception that bottled water is healthier than water from the tap. The first is a report by the Government Accountability Office that was originally requested by our former colleagues, Hilda Solis 
and they all win. In this report, GAO examines whether federal and state authorities are adequately ensuring the safety of bottled water and the accuracy of claims regarding its purity and health benefits. The second report is by the Environmental Working Group, which conducted an 18-month survey of bottled water labels and websites and concluded that just two of the 188 bottled water companies surveyed provided consumers with information on the source of their water, the manner in which it's treated, and any contaminants present. Given these findings by GAO and the Environmental Working Group, the subcommittee is sending today to a dozen bottled water companies letters requesting information on the source of their water, their treatment methods, and results of their contaminant testing for the past two years. Even when water is treated at municipal facilities and then bottled, there still may be questions about contaminants, such as pharmaceuticals that may be present in the treated water. The Environmental Working Group report suggests that an estimated 25 percent of bottled water brands that rely on tap water are drawing from supplies that collectively contain 260 pollutants. According to Associated Press, drugs have been found in municipal water samples across the country. Officials in Philadelphia discovered 56 pharmaceuticals or byproducts in treated drinking water. Anti-epileptic and anti-anxiety medications were detected in the treated drinking water for 18.5 million people in Southern California. And drinking water here in Washington, D.C. and surrounding areas tested positive for six pharmaceuticals. For these reasons, I have introduced H.R. 1359, the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act of 2009, which, pro which will provide for proper disposal through drug take-back programs so individuals are not simply flushing their medications down the toilet into our water systems. I'm also proud to be the original co-sponsor of the Food Safety Enhancement Act of 2009, which passed out of this committee last month and which is getting ready for floor action and which provides FDA with much needed authority to assessing testing records of food and water suppliers. I look forward to today's hearing and I ask for unanimous consent that reports issued today and the other documents in the binder prepared by staff be entered into the official record. Without objection, they'll be entered in the record and will be used throughout the hearing. I'd next like to turn to my friend, Mr. Walden from Oregon, for his opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Stupak. My home state of Oregon and the 2nd Congressional District, which I represent, is home to a number of water bottlers, including those located in the small central Oregon community of Culver, Earth uh, 2 0, in the eastern Oregon town of Cove with Artesian Blue, and in the northern portion of my district in the Dalles, H2 Oregon. These successful businesses are in many cases providing much needed job opportunities in areas of Oregon that have been hard hit by today's weak economy. In fact, Mr. Chairman, our unemployment rate is second only to yours in Michigan. Today's hearing raises some valid questions regarding the differences in regulation between the Food and Drug Administration and the EPA regarding bottled water. However, I should note uh, concern that with all of the life-threatening health priorities facing the FDA, including numerous foodborne illness outbreaks, complications with acetaminophen, and swine flu pandemic, this issue does to me seem a little secondary in terms of the FDA's uh, overwhelming workload on other issues. We should also put this hearing in context. The two reports that are the focus of today's hearing point out a few noteworthy findings but do not assess the safety of the bottled water itself. Neither the Government Accountability Office, GAO, nor the Environmental Working Group, EWG, conducted any testing of the bottled water or the bottles themselves while completing their reports. The regulations for bottled water do differ from those promulgated for tap water, mostly because bottled water is considered a food product and is therefore regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, whereas tap water is regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. However, FDA does require that the standards of quality for bottled water must be no less protective of public health than the EPA standard. Under the FDA regulations, bottlers must follow current good manufacturing practices, also known as GMPs. FDA actually requires more safeguards from water bottlers than other food processors. The GMPs for bottled water are commodity specific. Under these GMPs, bottlers must, among other things, test their source of water once a week for microbiological contaminants and test finished bottled water weekly for microbiological contaminants. 
Now, some of the water bottlers in my district follow a practice of testing their water every hour in order to meet requirements of purchasers of their product. So they are doing uh, hourly water testing. I do have a few questions for FDA. One discrepancy between EPA and FDA is in the case of a chemical substance called DEHP. This is a phthalate, a substance uh, added to plastics to change their physical characteristics, and I am sure you are familiar with it. FDA has yet to establish a standard for this contaminant in bottled water, even though the APA did over a decade ago. An FDA task force is supposedly examining the information surrounding DEHP, and I want to ask the Deputy Commissioner, when can we expect a ruling from your agency? And the question is, that I will speak to in a minute, is about recycled bottles themselves. I have had some tell me that uh, uh, the use of recycled bottles perhaps produces uh, more leaching or whatever it is that comes out of the plastic than first-time use, and I would be curious to know if that is the case. Conducting inspections is one way the FDA ensures the bottlers are following GMPs. Concerns have been raised on how frequently the plants are inspected and what access FDA inspectors have to plant records regarding testing and other important information during the inspection. I would be curious to know the legislation passed unanimously out of the full committee it, that expands FDA's inspection process if that would apply in these cases, and therefore you will get new authority if the House and uh, the Senate act. I would like to hear from uh, the Deputy Commissioner as well on how the agency can improve the inspection process and if you do need any additional authorities. If Congress needs to act, we need to know exactly what the agency needs and why. Currently, bottlers are not required to disclose the source of their water, the treatment process used, or the detection of any contaminants. The question is, should they? And I look forward to your response on that. Mr. Chairman, I would conclude by thanking you for this hearing. Um, but I would also like to raise the issue that July 8th has come and gone. A number of us on this side of the aisle have raised questions of the Environmental Protection Administration regarding bottled up science. Um, and we expect the EPA to respond to our inquiries regarding Dr. Alan Carlin and his report that was not allowed to be considered in the endangerment finding process. And uh, if, if the EPA is uh, unwilling to respond in a timely manner, which uh, may well be the case, I do hope that our request of this committee to have an oversight hearing on uh, what appears to be uh, the bottling up of science and debate on the uh, whole carbon issue uh, will be granted an opportunity for a hearing and a full investigation. So we will be coming back to you on that issue, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Walden. Uh, Ms. Blackburn, opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to welcome our witnesses and thank them for being with us today. As uh, you have heard, we all are concerned about bottled water, the product that is there. We are also concerned about tap water and the work the EPA does there. And I will submit a written statement. But Mr. Chairman, I want to take my time to just say I would prefer that we be spending this time to look at other issues that are important to our constituents that the FDA and the EPA uh, deal with. Uh, there are other committee issues that we could be looking at, such as the options for reducing health care costs for our constituents and looking at how you do that through patient-driven uh, consumer-driven, patient-centered health care. Uh, we should be looking at the Medicare trust fund and the pressures that are on that trust fund. Uh, the ballooning cost of Medicaid, if we move to a public option as uh, we move into uh, health care reform, or even from my state, the lessons that should have been learned from TennCare, which was the test case for Hillary Clinton health care back in 94. My state still has this. It is the greatest public health failure in the country. That would be a great opportunity for us to look at what is affecting us with health care. Certainly there are more pressing issues. We are appreciative of your time to be before us today. And while we all are concerned with leaching chemicals that come from plastics into bottled water, uh, we are indeed very concerned with uh, what we see as sequestering evidence from EPA employees. We are concerned with what we see of health care issues that are affecting all of our constituents and a lack of willingness to address those in a patient-centered, consumer-driven manner. And I yield back my time. 
Thank you. Let, let me just respond that, um, you know, we had a hearing just before we broke here not even two weeks ago on health insurance on rescissions, uh, where companies uh, rescind health care to people who have it. And uh, next week is uh, scheduled all week in committee for the uh, health care market bill. So I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to speak of health care. Um, Mr. Burgess, for opening statement, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, maybe I should just take a second and respond to your response. And isn't it a shame that we have a subcommittee on health within the Committee on Energy and Commerce, and we are to have no markup on what is going to be the greatest change in the delivery of health care in America since the institution of Medicare in 1965. Certainly, the people who were in Congress in 1965 likely could have never foreseen what Medicare would become, at least as far as the price of that federal program. And wouldn't we all be in better shape today if perhaps a little more care was taken back in 1965? And the object lesson for us today is we need to take good care and exercise due caution as we structure this major fundamental change to American health care. Um, we also could have had a hearing on medical devices uh, in this subcommittee, which I have asked for for some time and uh, has yet been forthcoming. So there are, there are ways we could have made use of this time today, Mr. Chairman, but here we are, and we're going to talk about bottled water this morning, and that's important. Uh, normally, I have a bottle of water here so that if I get parched in the hour that I have to address the committee, um, but now we are stuck with uh, D.C. water, which there used to be a little sign in my office in the Longworth building that said, do not drink the tap water. I don't know if that's changed, but I'm, I'm a little reluctant to drink what's uh, before us today. A pretty broad definition of food uh, would be one that included bottled water, and the tremendous breadth and depth of the responsibility entrusted to our good friends at the Food and Drug Administration is this $11 billion industry known as bottled water. The Amer average American consumer is unlikely to think that the FDA would be the primary regulator of bottled water, but it is. The regulatory responsibility of bottled water is split between the Environmental Protection Agency and the Federal Food and Drug Cosmetic Act, with the Food and Drug Administration overseeing the process of taking public water in its natural form in the environment into a convenient plastic container for sale to the American consumer. And now, as much as I appreciate the collegiality, the intelligence, and the willingness of Dr. Sharfstein to appear here today as a representative of the Food and Drug Administration, it does seem odd to only have the Food and Drug Administration here to answer tough questions and to not have the Environmental Protection Agency to answer questions that uh, would fall into their jurisdiction um, about the standards for municipal water versus bottled water. And currently, bottled water requires a higher threshold of testing than municipal water. Municipal water is required to be tested every four years, bottled water every year. In fact, bottled water is currently one of the few standalone industries with its own code of federal regulations regarding good manufacturing processes. From the definition of water to the testing and sampling of products, from the length of time the records must be kept, currently two years, and how they should be available to the Food and Drug Administration, as well as the role of the Environmental Protection Agency, the state and local government agencies in helping to ensure the safety and sanitation and quality of water, this burgeoning industry has seemingly existed in a compliance-oriented manufacturing system, rarely, if ever, producing bad actors. It was seen that this industry is an example of the ingenuity and innovation of the marketplace to create a product which had, uh, if you'll pardon the pun, an, unquenched, un an, unquenched, an unquenchable need for a convenient, transportable water, which, uh, and this uh, gr good idea has been met with uh, significant market success. We must ensure that the trust and faith of consumers, as well as the government, places bottled water in, that places that the government places in the bottled water industry, are not misguided. More Americans drink bottled water than milk or beer combined. So, if there is any step in this multi-layered process to deliver this food product where the trust and faith is misallocated, then certainly I look forward to having the science point to a solution. Furthermore, any deficiencies in the regulation of bottled water, any potential fraud in the process of producing bottled water, and any alleged environmental issues of drainage of our natural resources and the burdensome transportation costs in moving the end product, uh, we will certainly look forward to seeing the, uh, what is sure to be voluminous evidentiary proof. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. I'll yield back the balance of my time. No problem. I didn't want you to get parched. And, um, I was worried. <laughs> as you know, on the House Subcommittee, you guys did hold a hearing on medical devices last month and the 510K approval process. So those hearings are being taken. Uh, 
this hearing. But I would submit the investigatory part of that has has not been concluded, sure. at least to my satisfaction. And I think this subcommittee and, would be the appropriate place to have that. And in addition, we've got the whole question of biosimilars out there that will probably just roll into this health care bill. And we've not had the uh, the FDA in to talk to us about the science of biosimilars. So there's stuff we could be doing. Is all of the, the point? Absolutely. I'm make. And uh, this committee has been very active, as you know, for the last two years, and we hold many, many hearings. And this one, with the two reports being released today, it really dovetails in everything we've been doing for the last couple of years in food safety and uh, whether it's BPA or the pet that we talk about here or as Mr. Walden brought up the DEHP, why is it taking 15 years to put out regulations for that? Uh, certify labs, test results, all that is contained in this hearing so it's not just strictly bottled water, false advertising, I mean that's what this whole thing is about. Sort of, sort of wraps up everything we've been doing for the last few years and we do have these two reports coming out today so we thought it was appropriate to have the hearing today. Uh, so, very good. Mr. Barton, opening statement, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me say before I give my prepared statement how much uh, I personally appreciate you, so don't take some of what I'm about to say too personally. Uh, but I, I think it does say something, given the uh, serious issues <clears throat> which you have traditionally uh, tackled as your subcommittee chairmanship, along with Ranking Member Walden, that uh, uh, today's hearing doesn't rank at the top of that of that list, and it, it shows when you look uh, on your side how much uh, support there is. Uh, they may all be here, but they're disguised as empty chairs if they are. Well, you know, most of the committee is down in the consumer protection because we're putting a new administrator in there, and that's where most uh, of them are. In fact, that's why we started a little late because I'm also on that side. You're on that stop by there. Well, Greg and I'll take over if you want to go down there. <laughs> Can we have a vote on that right yeah. now? <laughs> anyway, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing does examine several interesting questions surrounding the differences between bottled water and tap water. Uh, these differences arise in regulatory approaches as well as in processing treatment and public perception. Several of the witnesses today, including the Government Accountability Office, the Food and Drug Administration, will discuss and possibly debate ways in which bottled water regulations should be changed and possibly improved. Other witnesses, including the Environmental Working Group and the International Bottled Waters Association, will discuss ways the industry can be more transparent and responsive to consumer inquiries. I don't have a problem with transparency. In fact, I'm pushing transparency in the upcoming uh, health care debate. Uh, and as you well know, I am certainly pushing transparency at the Environmental Protection Agency, where Mr. Walden and I have asked the EPA to release their documents concerning their suppression of the EPA report within its own agency. Uh, debating whether there really is an endangerment finding with regards to um, CO2. So those of us on the minority are concerned whether this particular hearing is the best use of our limited oversight and hearing times. Uh, we have confronted uh, the issue of swine flu pandemic. We've, we've confronted uh, the safety of products like Tylenol. Uh, as I said a minute ago, Mr. Chairman, this one just doesn't seem to be up to that standard of excellence which you have established for your oversight. Uh, I hope that uh, after this hearing you will consider supporting Mr. Walden and myself on getting information uh, about the EPA suppression of the document which we call Carbon Gate regarding the CO2 and the endangerment finding. We also hope that you'll work with us as I talked with you yesterday informally about doing more hearings and doing some action items on the automobile de dealer closure issue. I know that's something that's very important to you personally. Uh, we await uh, your response and Mr. Uh, Waxman's response. So, Mr. Chairman, um, we always appreciate when you hold a hearing. We always participate, uh, and we're looking forward to going on to uh, uh, a little bit more intense issues in the future. But again, thank you for holding this hearing. Well, thanks, Mr. Barton. And, and you know, and one reason why we're having this hearing, because I think, uh, as we've seen on, on, on your side a little bit, maybe we assume, maybe we assume because it's in a bottle like this, it's healthy, it's clean, it's pure, and that's an assumption I think we erroneously are making. So we're doing a hearing to try to get to the issues here, because I don't think we have to wait for a deadly outbreak of disease in bottled water like we've seen in salmonella peanut butter last year. Uh, and we can't say there's zero risk here. Uh, between 2002 and 2008, there were 23 recalls of bottled water. Uh, that's about one every quarter. Most of it stemmed from elevated level of contaminants such as arsenic and bromate, both which cause cancer, 
For the past six years, the FDA has issued three warning letters to bottled water companies for violating safety regulations, and that's in addition to dozens of other problems found in the EPA inspections at bottled watering or water bottling facilities. In 2007, the FDA issued a press release uh, against drinking mineral water imported from Armenia because the arsenic level was 50 times greater than the federal standard. And that's, and then, like I said, last month in Southern California, we had girls uh, sick at a high school for buying bottled water out of a vending machine. So these are problems the FDA has uncovered, and they only have about two or three employees devoted to it. And I think, as I said earlier, I think just because it comes in a bo bottle, we assume it's healthier for us. That's what most Americans assume. We find it's not the case, and that's the reason for one of the hearing. And the, all the other hearings we've done this year on salmonella, institutional review boards, dual use, uh, so we've got a lot going on here. Mr. Walden, go yeah, ahead. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, just, just two points. One I, I didn't mention in my testimony, but I know that water is also an, agreed, is an ingredient in many other drinks. And I guess the question I would have for our panel as well is just because it's clear and in those bottles, um, how is that treated or monitored versus if it's colored and, and sugared <laughs> and, and perhaps carbonated? Does somebody check the water that goes into to that as well? How, are there different standards there? The second point I would make on your Santa Clara, I think it's Santa Clara, the junior high students. Right. My, my understanding is the FBI may be involved in an investigation there, so it might be more of a tampering issue. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Um, they, they are involved, but um, no one's reached a conclusion whether it's right. tampering. That's, I, I understand. I yep. wasn't trying to jump to a conclusion, right. but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, you bet. Well, that's a good segue into our first panel. Uh, let me introduce our first panel of witnesses. We have Mr. Joseph Stevenson, who is Director of Natural Resources and the Environment at the Government Accountability Office. We have Dr. Joshua Sarfstein, who is the Principal Deputy Commissioner at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Ms. Jane Houlihan, who is the Senior Vice President for Research at the Environmental Working Group. And Mr. Joseph K. Doss, who is the President of the International Bottled Water Association. It is the policy of this subcommittee to take all testimony under oath. Please be advised that you have the right under the rules of the House to be advised by counsel during your testimony. Do you wish to be represented or do you wish to be represented by counsel? Mr. Stevenson? No. Dr. Sharfstein? Ms. Hulan? No. Okay. Then I'm going to ask you to please rise, raise your right hand, take the oath. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but truth, a matter pending before this committee? Let the record reflect the witnesses have replied in the affirmative. You are now under oath. We will now hear a five-minute opening statement from our witnesses. You may submit a longer statement for the record and would be included in today's hearing record. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Walden. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the quality and safety of bottled water and its environmental impacts. Over the past decade, the per capita consumption of bottled water in the United States has more than doubled from 13.4 gallons per person in 1997 to 29.3 gallons per person in 2007. That is over 200 bottles a year for every man, woman and child and an 11 plus billion dollar market. With this increase have come several questions and concerns over bottled water's quality and safety. My testimony is based on the report that we are issuing to the committee today, which is going to be publicly released. In summary, we found that FDA safety and consumer protections are less stringent for bottled water than comparable EPA protections for tap water. While FDA standards for bottled water generally mirror the standards for, the near, for nearly all of the 88 contaminants covered by EPA's national primary drinking water regulations, there is one notable excep exception, DEHP, which is a plasticizer used to soften plastic which has been linked to reproductive and liver problems and increased cancer risk. And it has been regulated by the EPA and tap water since 1992, but FDA deferred action on DEHP in a final rule published in 1996 and has yet to either adopt a standard or publish a reason for not doing so, even though the statutory deadline for acting was more than 15 years ago. Since DEHP is used in food packaging as well as bottled water, this is a broader issue that FDA is still studying. Nevertheless, our report recommends that FDA expeditiously promulgate a DEPH standard for bottled water. 
More broadly, we found that FDA, unlike EPA, does not have the statutory authority to require bottlers to use certified laboratories for water quality tests or to report test results, even if violations of the standards are found. Most tests are done by the bottlers themselves. Several states have requirements to safeguard bottled water that exceed those of FDA, but are still less comprehensive than for tap water. In addition, while FDA bottled water labeling requirements are similar to labeling requirements for other foods, they provide consumers with far less information about the source and quality of water than what EPA requires of public water systems under the Safe Drinking Water Act. For example, public water systems must annually provide consumer confidence reports that summarize water quality information about the water's sources, detected contaminants, and compliance with national primary drinking water regulations, as well as information on the potential health effects of certain contaminants. FDA does not require bottled water companies to provide similar information. In a study mandated by the 1996 amendments to the Safe Drinking Water Act, FDA concluded that it was feasible for the bottled water industry to provide the same type of information to consumers that public water systems must provide. However, the agency was not required to act on its findings and has yet to do so. Our survey of 50 states in the District of Columbia showed that consumers have misconceptions about bottled water believing that it is safer and healthier than tap water. We also found that information comparable to what public water systems are required to provide to consumers of tap water was available for only a small percentage of the 83 bottled water labels we examined, companies we contacted, or company websites we reviewed. We believe that consumers would benefit from better information on the quality and safety of bottled water, and our report also recommends that FDA implement the results of its study to accomplish this. In examining the environmental effects of bottled water, we found that only about 25 percent of water bottles are recycled and that the remaining 75 percent are discarded to municipal landfills where they never decompose and essentially remain forever. While this over 900,000 tons of plastic annually, it represents less than 1 percent of municipal waste. Another issue is the amount of energy used to manufacture and transport bottled water. Another study estimates the energy used at 5.8 megajoules per liter. At the current rate of consumption, this is the equivalent of the energy used by 4.7 million households for a year and is 1,000 to 2,000 times the energy used for tap water. We also found that groundwater extraction for bottled water facilities in selected areas um, and that Michigan and other states have passed laws to minimize the impact of stream levels and wetlands. Finally, I would note that some of our bottled water findings are indicative of FDA's overall food safety oversight problems that led to GAO's designating it a high-risk area in January 2007 and again in 2009 when we called for a fundamental reexamination of the federal food safety system. We believe that FDA's lack of authority and resources to effectively regulate bottled water should be part of that reexamination. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the summary of my statement, and I'll be happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. Dr. Sharfstein, uh, would you like an opening statement? Thank you very much. I you might want to pull that mic up a little, a little bit more. Closer. Thank you. We appreciated the J.O. report, and I especially appreciate that he finished with exactly two seconds left as I was watching. I've never seen that before. Um, I, good morning, I'm Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. I'm Dr. Joshua Sharfstein, the Principal Deputy Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration in the Department of Health and Human Services. I want to thank the committee for your work on a wide range of health issues and for the opportunity to discuss FDA's regulation of bottled water today. As has been uh, mentioned, bottled water and tap water are regulated by two separate agencies. FDA regulates bottled water, while the EPA regulates tap water, also referred to as municipal water or public drinking water. EPA has regulations on the production, distribution, and quality of public drinking water, including source water protection, operation of drinking water systems, contaminant levels, and reporting requirements. The Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act provides FDA with regulatory authority over food and, as part of that, bottled water that is introduced into interstate commerce. Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, manufacturers are responsible for producing safe, wholesome, and truthfully labeled food products. It is a violation of the law to introduce into interstate commerce adulterated or misbranded um, products. FDA has established specific regulations for bottled water in the Code of Federal Regulations. These regulations include standard of identity regulations that define different types of bottled water, such as spring water versus mineral water, and standard of quality regulations that establish allowable levels for chemical, physical, microbial, and radiological contaminants. 
FDA has established good manufacturing practice regulations for the processing and bottling of bottled drinking water. Um, labeling and GMP regulations for foods in general also apply to bottled water. Federal law requires FDA to set similar standards for bottled water as exists for municipal water or explain why they should not apply. FDA has established such standards for more than 90 contaminants, and in some cases, such as for lead or copper, the FDA limits are stricter for bottled water than for municipal water. And another point to, uh, to make in this regard is that the way that the testing is done is different. For example, a, a municipal, take the, the lead standard, any uh, test that is high is violative that is done on FDA regulated bottled water. For the municipal water, it's, if only a percentage of the samples is above a certain level does the um, municipal water supply um, fail that. So, just, so they are allowed to have certain failures and not have it as a failure for the municipal water supply. So it, it just illustrates that there is a different approach that is taken in the two contexts. FDA monitors and inspects bottled water products and processing plants as part of the general food safety program. Inspections occur approximately once every one to three years. The agency um, ins inspects violative firms more frequently depending on the number, significance and recurrence of violations. FDA's field offices follow up on consumer and trade complaints and other leads on potentially violative bottled water products. As for other types of food, FDA periodically collects and analyzes samples of bottled water. Samples of foreign bottled water offered for entry may be collected and tested to determine if they are in compliance with the laws and regulations. And uh, labs may test the water for microbial, radiological or chemical contamination. In recent years, FDA has promulgated a number of quality standards for bottled water in conjunction with EPA. Most recently, on May 29, 2009, FDA published a final rule to require that bottled water manufacturers test source water and finished bottled water products for total coliform organisms and to prohibit distribution of products containing any E. coli in an indicator of fecal contamination. FDA is also requiring that before a bottler can use source water from a source that is tested positive for E. coli, the, bottle, the bottler must take appropriate measures to rectify or eliminate the cause of the problem, and the bottler must keep records of such actions. In general, FDA's oversight of bottled water I think can be described as successful. The agency is aware of no major outbreaks of illness or serious safety concerns associated with bottled water over the past decade. FDA is aware the GAO report released today highlights a number of issues that the agency faces in regulating bottled water. FDA's work with GAO to provide information and assist with their investigation. Let me address some of the issues that GAO has raised. And let me say that while I do believe that FDA's oversight has been generally successful, I also believe that there is room for improvement. First, JAO found that FDA has not yet set a standard for the phthalate known as DEHP. This was contemplated in 1996, but the administration at the time did not pursue this because of a legal issue that we could discuss further if you want, known as prior sanction. We are now revisiting this decision and intend to uh, pursue a DEHP standard as anticipated under the law. Second, JAO found that FDA labeling regulations for bottled water provided for less information about the sources and quality of water than required by EPA for municipal systems. FDA has found that it would be feasible for manufacturers of bottled water to provide such information to consumers. However, the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act does not provide a mechanism to require bottlers to make that information available, so Congress would have to take additional action. Third, GAO expressed concern that FDA cannot require the submission of results to the agency on tests conducted by bottled water manufacturers. This is a, a, a fair point and um, it is a part of the oversight of water and food in general that should be strengthened. In fact, it would be strengthened by the um, food safety legislation that the committee has shown so much uh, leadership on. Fourth, GAO has pointed out that FDA does not have specific authority to mandate the use of certified laboratories. This is also a um, uh, a reasonable point, and uh, FDA does require the use of methods that are at least as sensitive as FDA's methods, but the food safety legislation passed by the committee would also be extremely helpful here. Um, I would also mention that the food safety legislation provides for food safety plans, hazard analyses and preventive controls that will complement FDA's good manufacturing practices for bottled water facilities and generally um, strengthen the system of oversight for bottled water and food. Um, and for foreign produced bottled water, the Act would require importers to register with FDA to comply with good importer practices and give FDA the authority to require certification as a condition of importation. So we will continue to work with this committee on uh, the legislation, which we think is very important, and 
I'm uh, pleased to be here and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Ms. Houlihan, would you pull that mic over? And Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, subcommittee, I'm Jane Houlihan, Senior Vice President for Research at Environmental Working Group. We're a nonprofit research and advocacy organization in Washington, D.C. Thank you for holding this hearing. Today we're releasing an 18-month survey of labels and websites for 188 bottled waters. Here's what we found. Consumers spend about 1,900 times more for bottled water than for tap water, yet they often have no way to learn essential facts about what's actually in the bottle. Only two of 188 bottled waters make public three basic facts routinely disclosed by local tap water utilities. These are the specific name and location of the water source, purification methods, and chemical pollutants that remain in the water after treatment. These two brands are Ozarka Drinking Water and Penta Ultra Purified Water, the only two of 188 doing so. Bottled water companies are not required to make these basic facts public. And here's the reason. They enjoy a regulatory holiday under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act with near complete latitude on what, if any, information to share with consumers. In contrast, every one of the nation's 52,000 municipal water suppliers produces an annual water quality report, giving its water source and pollutant testing results as required under the Safe Drinking Water Act. EPA calls these reports the centerpiece of consumers' right to know about water quality. This double standard is unfair to consumers who have a right to know what's in the water they buy. Surveys show that over half of bottled water drinkers choose it because they're worried about the safety of their tap water. They believe it's free of contaminants. They do it for their health. But in too many cases, consumers have no way to check if the purity they're looking for is what they're actually getting. So where does the water come from? Our survey found that 30 percent of bottled waters provide no information whatsoever about their water source on the label but 37% fully divulge both the name and location of their water source, and the remaining 33% give generic information like spring or deep aquifer. If you could look at figure one in your packet, please. This is a, a brand that's doing the right thing. It's a great value. It's, it's called in your figure a, a smaller brand. It, it's not in the top 10, but it is actually distributed by Walmart. You'll see on the label the source clearly indicated municipal supply, Fort Worth, Texas, so you know exactly where this water comes from. You'll also see the treatment method on this label, reverse osmosis. Let's look at the next figure. By way of contrast, on the other end of the spectrum is Dasani. On this label, you'll see that the product is pure and it's crisp and it has a fresh taste, but nowhere on this label will you find the source of that water. Dasani is one of 30% of the brands not giving any information on source along with Whole Foods, Food Lion, CVS, Kroger, store brands, and many other brands. How is bottled water purified? Bottled water companies are not required to disclose what, if any, methods they use to purify their water. Municipal water suppliers aren't required to disclose this information either, but most of them do. We found that 44 percent of bottled waters provide no treatment information on labels. One third provide no information on labels or websites. If you look at figure two in your packet, you'll see a label for Ozarka. This is a Nestle brand that's actually doing the right thing. You'll see on this label the water comes from the Houston Municipal Water Supply, but it doesn't stop there. It's further treated by reverse osmosis, carbon filtration, microfiltration, and ozonation. Now, for contrast, let me read to you what you'll see on a Fiji label. The purest water comes from the purest clouds. Our rainfall is purified by trade winds as it travels across the Pacific Ocean to the islands of Fiji. And that is all the information you'll see on treatment on that label. And Fiji is one of the 60% of bottled waters that print marketing claims of purity from among those waters that don't label their treatment methods. Consumers have no way to know if the claims are true. What pollutants are in bottled water? Every tap water utility publishes an annual water quality report listing all their results for the year, but only 18 percent of bottled waters do the same. Those that do include all eight domestic Nestle brands, those that don't include Aquafina, which is a Pepsi brand in figure three of your packet. Without data, consumers are left with marketing claims, and these are extensive. You've heard Poland Springs, a man who lived 52 additional years after drinking the water. Mountain Valley Springs became known as a remedy for the treatment of gout, rheumatism, and other diseases. Evian claims its water is a symbol of health, general well-being. Volvix water is extremely pure, but they don't publish a test report. And finally, Aquamantra's water resonates with the energy and frequency of well-being. 
When you pay a premium price for bottled water, you deserve more than just claims. We recommend that bottled water labels and websites disclose the same information that the law requires of municipal water utilities and that this disclosure be mandatory. Consumers have a right to know where their bottled water comes from, how or if it's treated, and the pollutants it contains. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Doss, uh, your opening statement, please, sir. Good morning, Chairman Spitback, Ranking Member Walden, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Joe Doss. I am President and CEO of the International Bottled Water Association. I appreciate very much this opportunity to discuss the regulation of bottled water. Bottled water, whether in retail size packages or in the larger containers used in home and office water coolers, is a safe, healthy, convenient beverage. It's comprehensively regulated as a packaged food product at both federal and state levels. And as with other packaged food and beverages, bottled water must meet FDA's general food regulations, which include extensive labeling requirements for ingredients, the name and place of business of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor, product net weight, and if required, nutrition labeling. In addition, FDA promulgated separate standards, as we've heard, uh, separate standards of identity, uh, including labeling requirements that identify the type of bottled water, standards of quality, and good manufacturing practices specifically for bottled water. Federal law requires FDA bottled water regulations to be as protective of the public health as EPA standards for public drinking water systems. And to that end, FDA has established bottled water standards for quality for more than 90 substances. Most FDA bottled water quality standards are the same as EPA's maximum contaminant levels for public water systems. The few differences in regulated substances are because they are not found in bottled water or they are regulated under another provision of law, such as FDA's food additive program. If a container of bottled water has a contaminant that exceeds an FDA standard, this fact must, by law, be disclosed, be disclosed on the label. The failure of a bottled water container to meet the standards of quality and be properly labeled is subject, subject to recall by the company and enforcement action by FDA. If a bottled water product source is a public water system, and the finished bottled water product does not meet the FDA standard of identity for purified or sterile water, that product label must disclose the fact that it comes from a public water source. It's also important to note that the courts have held that FDA's jurisdiction over food and beverages extends not only to those products that move in interstate commerce, but to those products sold within a single state if they are using packaging materials that have moved in interstate commerce, such as bottled, the casks, or other and that is the case for almost every bottle of water sold in the United States. In addition, Congress has created a statutory presumption of interstate commerce for all FDA regulated products, including bottled water. Now, while the current laws regulating bottled water products protect public health, IBWA members and others in the industry have recently worked with the Energy and Commerce Committee. Thank you. Energy and Commerce Committee to update the food safety laws. IBWA supports a risk-based inspection system that would require inspections at all food facilities every six months to three years, a requirement for all food manufacturers to conduct a hazard analysis and establish and maintain preventive controls, which all IBWA members already do as a condition of membership, and granting FDA authority to mandate recall under circumstances where a food product presents an imminent threat of serious adverse health consequences or death. IBWA supports a consumer's right to clear, accurate, and comprehensive information about the bottled water products they purchase. As I mentioned, all packaged food and beverages, including bottled water, are subject to extensive FDA labeling requirements that provide consumers with a great deal of product quality information. In addition, virtually all bottled water products include a phone number on the label that consumers can use to contact the company. In fact, IBWA petitioned FDA in 2001 to require all bottled water labels to include a phone number on, their, on the label. IBWA believes that the most feasible way for consumers to obtain information not already on the label is through a request to the bottler. In addition, consumers can go to the IBWA website to obtain contact information or water, water quality information for all IBWA member brands. Consumers have many options when choosing which bottled water brand to drink. If a bottled water company does not provide them with the information that they want, he or she can choose another brand of bottled water. That is not the case with tap water. Consumers cannot choose which public water system is piped into their homes, and that is the fundamental issue, consumer choice. Unfortunately, many people want to make this out to be a bottled water versus tap water issue. We just don't see it that way. If people are drinking water, whether it's tap or bottled, that's a good thing, and consumers should be free to choose. 
In fact, 75 percent of consumers who drink bottled water also choose to drink tap water. IBWA supports investments to improve the U.S. public drinking water system in order to maintain the highest quality of water for all citizens. And with the increase in diabetes, obesity, and heart disease rates in the United States, any actions that would discourage consumers from drinking bottled water are not in the public interest. Throughout the years, bottled water companies have always responded to the need for clean, safe drinking water after natural disasters such as hurricanes, floods, and forest fires, and in emergency situations such as terrorist attacks and boil alerts. However, the bottled water industry cannot exist only for disaster response. The vast majority of bottled water companies in the United States are primarily family-owned and operated small businesses that depend on a viable commercial market to provide the resources necessary to respond in emergency situations. In fact, 90 percent of IBWA's members uh, have gross sales of less than $10 million a year. In summary, bottled water is a safe, healthy, convenient food product that is comprehensively regulated at the federal and state level. IBWA stands ready to assist the subcommittee as it considers this very important issue. Thank you for considering our views. Well, thanks. We'll uh, start with questions, and thank you all for your uh, comments. Uh, Mr. Doss, let me ask you this. Uh, is it true 80 percent of the water bottlers are part of your organization, about 80 percent of the I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not water sure. bottlers in this country, they, they belong to your organization? The water. I would say we probably represent 75 percent of the uh, actual facilities. Okay. Um, is Desani or Coca-Cola, is they, they part of yours? Desani is not a member of the association. How about um, Nestle? Nestle is a member of the okay. association. And how about Aquafina? That's uh, Pepsi, Aquafina right? Aquafina is not a member of the okay. association. So are, are those the three biggest? Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle? Those are three Nestle. Of the, the largest companies. So two of the three are not part of your organization. That's correct. Okay. Your standards, which uh, track many of the things we've recommended in GAO and the others, that's voluntary standards you're, you try to have your members comply with? Uh, IBWA has always tried to, uh, you know, have the highest possible safety standards. Right. So we have a mandatory requirement for our members, and if they don't meet those standards, then they cannot be a member of the International Bottled Water Association. Okay. Do you do anything on the advertising then? I mean, no, we've seen these crazy is not an issue that we claims. deal with. Obviously, that's a case-by-case -case situation where there are state and federal laws uh, that would allow companies to be, uh, action to be brought against them for deceptive or misleading advertising. So we don't do anything in that regard. Okay. So, um, like Aqua Mantra about uh, these mantras inherently penetrate the molecular structure of the water. You guys don't condone, condone any of that? It, it is not something. The association does not deal with advertising issues. It's something that would be left to the state and federal authorities. Well, the, the company went on to say that it consulted with, and I use the word consulted because that's what's said on the website, with a Dr. Marusa Imoto who wrote a book called Hidden Messages in Water. And, and, and what the company said, it, he showed us the basic principles of quantum theory whereby the molecular structure of water was changed by a Zen Buddhist monk's thought. Based on this premise, Aquamantra uses the design on its labels to affect the molecular structure of California natural spring water to make it more refreshing and wholesome. Is there any water studies that, uh, that the Zen monk can change the molecular structure of water? Well, I, I can't speak to what uh, okay. that company has, has uh, found. Uh, I, I just can't speak to that. I, I don't know that they're a member of IBWA, but so I, I really okay. can't comment on what information they may have about what they say on their label or other materials. Uh, Dr. Sharfstein, you've um, seen anything quite like this. Uh, do you think those should be part of the uh, labeling of uh, water, bottled water? Does Buddhist uh, or, or I'm sorry, Zen Buddhist monks' thoughts that can change the structure of water? I would be highly skeptical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but, you know, we, we've seen in, uh, Ms. Houlihan pointed out, and a couple others, these are just sort of like fantastical uh, claims. Um, are, are they legal? I mean, can, can they do it underneath your misbranding or, or false advertising? Well, we'll definitely look in this case. In general, um, misbranding uh, pertains to whether people are claiming to treat disease. That's the big one. That's where we put our priority. If people are saying you drink this water and it cures your cancer, then people may not pursue cancer treatment. So like Mr. Ricker who uh, in Poland Springs who had a miraculous recovery and lived there 52 years and mm -hmm. it's good for liver and kidney diseases. Is that 
Well, there were two that you, you know, the, the one with right. the historical fable. I don't know if that's a exactly yeah, an Mr. Ricker, thing that right. you're making, but the other one where you said um, used in clinical, clinical studies tests to address Philadelphia, St. Louis. That, yeah. that one, I think we'd like to see. I mean, that that to me strikes me as pretty, you know, uh, worth our evaluating. I'm not familiar with that, but I think that would definitely uh, fall into something we would want to look closely at. How about the other one, the makers of H2OM, H2OM? claim that they play music and sounds at their bottling facility that charge the water with special vibratory frequencies. Mm. Uh, would, would that be um, misadvertising? I'm not a musician, but I would still express skepticism about that okay. one. And I think that, uh, you know, we have um, the, the misbranding provision is really about things that are uh, we focus on, we really think we're going to pose a public health threat, a claim like that. And, I, you know, the, the issue about whether it treats kidney or, or liver diseases really does uh, raise that issue. Okay. Um, you know, in, in tab 13, it's that chart again, and we might want to put it back up on, on the board there. In, in, in the two reports by GAO and the Environmental Working Group talk about the regulations, and you mentioned a little bit in, in yours too, uh, the bottlers, this, uh, discover dangerous contaminants of water. They don't have to alert the public. Uh, municipalities, um, unlike municipalities, bottlers don't have to use certified labs. Water bottlers generally are not required to provide information about test results, the source of their products. Um, you know, take Desani here. We mentioned them today, and, and I have this bottle that is put on the airplane uh, when I fly back and forth. So, so I grabbed it with me as I was reading my testimony and looking at it. And when I go through and read it, you know, their claims aren't too outrageous. Uh, it's enhanced with minerals for a pure, fresh taste that can't be beat. And then you go to www.makeyourmouthwater.com. Uh, that's a little out there a little bit. But it says, bottled by CCDA Waters, LLC, Millersburg, Pennsylvania. But then underneath it, they have CT, and then the symbol for number, 992. Then they have NV07354. NYSHD certificate 173, and then they have another one, L. But CT, would that be Connecticut? NV, would that be Nevada? New York uh, State Health Department, I take, would be New York. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about sources or anything, just so you don't know where this water really came from Nevada, Connecticut, New York, yeah, or I Pennsylvania. I couldn't decipher that for you. Okay. I do Mr. Doss, anything on, can, can you help on that, uh, these markings I, on here? I can't say for sure because I obviously don't, I'm not familiar with that brand, but it may be that all of those states require the product to be registered like other food products do within the state. If you're going to sell products within a state, I think all food products tend to have those uh, registration uh, information okay. on, the, on the bottles. So you'd have to, my so you'd have to figure out, or probably that last one is probably a lot number, you'd have to go through, figure out your lot number to try to figure out where it came from, right? whether Nevada, Connecticut, New York, or Pennsylvania, or Coca-Cola in Atlanta, Georgia, because that address is on here, too. Uh, so really, the consumer has no way of knowing. I mean, and this is one of the big bottlers. Again, I can only tell yeah. you, I think that's what, what that is okay. and that's referring to. Mr. Walden? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, just like any food product uh, regulated by the FDA, if, it's, if dangerous contaminants are in the bottled water, it's considered adulterated by the FDA, correct, doctor? That's correct. And it violates the law if it's sold to consumers. I mean, people can go to jail if they do it. Okay. And, and if we're worried about some of these claims on the label, isn't that really also under the jurisdiction of the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, on false advertising and labeling? You know, I have, I have to get back to you. I'm not, I don't know if I can answer that. I think we do have certain jurisdiction there, and I'm not sure about the FTC. All right. I, I would assume that, that they would, but I don't know that for a fact, but it's something we ought to look at because it would be helpful if they were here today and the EPA was here today and mm -hmm. perhaps somebody from uh, Coca-Cola as well since they're not represented on, on this panel, but we're singling them out. Well, one thing I might want to mention is uh, in just a couple months, FDA is going to launch. Is your mic on, by the yeah. way? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. In just a couple months, uh, FDA is going to launch the reportable food registry that was uh, part of legislation the Congress passed. Right. And when that happens, we're anticipating September, um, companies will have to notify FDA if there is product release that 
um, could pose a risk to, to a serious risk to health. So some of the gap will be filled by that, but we really think the, you know, the passage of the food safety legislation is necessary right. to really close that. Yeah, we're hopeful that that can be brought up on the, I don't, is, Mr. Chairman, has that been scheduled for House floor consideration yet? Not yet. We were still working on trying to get the final touches. Okay. Um, in, in your testimony, uh, uh, Doctor, you, you discussed new FDA testing requirements for bottled water to include testing source water for total uh, coliforms and establish a zero tolerance for E. coli. Does the EPA require testing for coliforms in tap water and did the EPA establish a zero tolerance level for E. coli? Uh, give me one second. I have a good, I have some information on that right here. Sure. I was curious about that also. Because um, I think you made the case on lead that you have zero, zero tolerance for lead in bottled water, but EPA allows a certain. Yeah, I think, I think this, it, this illustrates the point that it's just a little different, the systems. Um, my understanding is that public water systems are required to collect monthly total coliform samples throughout their distribution systems, um, and that uh, if they're positive, they must be tested for E. coli. If you have, if, if for systems collecting more than 40 samples per month, if more than 5 percent are positive, that triggers a violation. Um, if it's less than 40 samples per month, then one positive sample triggers a violation. So, you know, for um, FDA bottled water, if there is any violation that kicks in for municipal, if it's a lot of tests, then there has to be a certain percentage of the test filed for it to trigger a violation. So the, the standards are slightly different. I hope I was able to explain that clearly enough. It, wow. they, they do a whole bunch of tests. Are they more stringent under your regulations or the EPA regulations? It's, uh, or is it just different? They're different. I mean, you know, because right. they, they, I know here in the District of Columbia, um, I think I'm correct in saying this that uh, we all went many years drinking the tap water, believing it to be safe only to discover that they hadn't really fully disclosed the amount of lead that was coming into the water through the pipes. Um, and, and so I, I don't know if you ran into that in Baltimore uh, when you were health commissioner there, but uh, as I recall, you advocated to people to buy it, to be safer to drink bottled water. <laughs> um, well, not, in, not for the population of Baltimore because the municipal water supply in Baltimore we felt very comfortable with. But for but public for school children? For public school children, yeah. that's right. In fact, uh, we, uh, I advised the school superintendent to turn off all the drinking fountains in the Baltimore City public schools uh, because of problems that they were having um, with mm. lead. And to go to bottled water. Problems, and to go to bottled water across the system. It turned out to be cheaper also, given the expense that they had of testing the right. municipal water because of the uh, old buildings and the problems yeah. they had with the pipes in the schools. So, you know, I certainly, as a, as a health commissioner, I think there are certain scenarios where, um, for example, after uh, certain types of disruption of the water supply, the water can be... Sure unsafe for a period of time and you right. recommend that people switch boil to bottled water or boil it. So there are scenarios like that. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doss, a, a question about this, this notion that uh, consumers are wanting to know what's in their, their bottled water and all. I, 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 while I, I want to know that it's safe when I drink it, um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to chase down what spring it came out, came out of or well. Uh, as long as I know it's safe. Uh, how many inquiries do you get through your association and all from people who say, I, I want to know the ingredients, I want to know the work? I mean, I, I, when I take water out of my place here in, in D.C., I, I, there's no label on the tap that tells me all this stuff. I wouldn't know where to go in the D.C. system to even find out. And frankly, as long as it's safe, I don't care. How, how much of this is, is, is the case? How many people are rushing to you and calling your folks saying, hey, I demand to know where we this have, water came IBWA, from. the association, has hardly gotten any comments, uh, any questions from consumers. I would, I have talked to some of my members, including our large members and our small and mid-sized members. Right. And they get very few requests. Now, I will. And say, how do they handle those requests? Um, they should provide them with the information. Do they, they disclose if, if they want testing results? If they want source information? Right. Whatever they ask for, you know, in in our opinion, that's what they should they should provide. And and that's our bottom line is that. If a consumer has a question, we believe right. they have the right to have that information. The real issue is how to best provide that information. I think that's the, the, the distinction here, and, and that's as was re, uh, related just a minute ago. These are two different systems. Bottled water is a packaged food product in a very different distribution system 
than tap water. Um, so there are necessarily some differences in the way you might want to provide the information. Um, and as far as the overall safety is concerned, again, they both have to be safe. There's just right. different ways that you get to that goal. Because I don't think in a, in, a, in a soft drink bottle they disclose where the liquid source come from, right? So they put water in a cola beverage, right? Is that right, doctor? I mean, I somebody? Is, isn't that the number one ingredient is water in these beverages we all drink? And, and, and last time I checked, nobody's saying, tell me where the water came from that's in there. It's not required to be on those labels, is it? And, and that's why, in, in many cases... So you're kind of being singled out. Right. Bottled water is a food product, so we follow the rules that are in is, place. Is, is a cola a food product? A, a cola is a food product and is not subject to the um, good manufacturing practices that exist specifically for bottled water. So there is a... Um, within the realm of... So is of there food, less, less oversight on, on our soda drinks? I, I wouldn't use necessarily... From FDA's word, perspective? Uh, maybe I wouldn't use the word oversight, but I would say there's definitely more... Um, uh, regulations and uh, on on which on bottled water than then uh, on cola product and, and I'm not picking on cola and versus right. the uncola versus you know the new cola versus whatever I'm just talking soft drinks that's correct so there's less uh, 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 oversight well I'll use the term oversight but but in terms of food safety issues. right I mean there are, there are good manufacturing practices right. that apply to foods generally that apply to colas and someone will tap me if I'm getting this totally wrong but sure. I understand that the um, the, the uh, bottled water has a whole set of regulations that are really just for bottled water and um, that relates to the fact Commodity that... Commodity-specific. Right. Regulations, which don't exist for soft drinks. Correct. Can I also say that one difference between bottled water and soda is also that people choose bottled water because they think it's healthier and safer than yeah, but that's, in a lot of cases, and that's not the reason they're choosing colas. So I think yeah, but, but right the question, whether they choose it or not, the question is it, it, that I thought you were getting at is consumers have the right to know the source of the ingredients in the bottle, and the labeling and all that. I mean, I, I want to know if, if I may think uh, a soda product is better than bottled water. I mean, I... Water is very different from other kinds of food products. It makes up, you know, more than half of our body, and we're advised to drink it at least right because it helps remove day, toxins so. and everything else. Exactly there, and so people are choosing bottled water sure. in particular, not colas, because there's a perception that it's safer and healthier than tap water, and I think that's why it's being singled out here over other foods because of the special place that it holds in people's minds. Also, because it's almost 2,000 times more expensive than tap water. And How much more expensive is a soda drink over tap water? Uh, maybe a similar amount, but people are making really tough choices right now about their right. budgets, and so bottled I've, water is part of that. And I've weighed, see, I've almost doubled over my time. No, that's right. We'll, we'll come back to our time, but I want to get to Ms. Christensen for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I just want to go over the contaminant uh, disclosure issue again so I'm clear. According to the Two new reports released today, it appears that consumers have access to a lot more information about contaminants in tap water than they do about contaminants in bottled water and in answer to some of the questions previously asked. Mr. Stevenson, under cu current law, municipal water authorities have to notify the public within 24 hours when they detect contaminants such as E. coli above prescribed level in tap water systems. Is that correct? That's right. And they have to send public that notice over broadcast media uh, or in warnings posted in conspicuous locations? Uh, yes, there's very, very specific requirements on how you report those. But if a bottled water company ran the same test on its water and found the same level of E. coli, uh, a level that both EPA and FDA say is dangerous to human health, uh, they don't have to tell the FDA or EPA or the public? Or the, or the state. Or well, some states do not require have it. to. Some states do require it, but not the FDA. A few states require, but generally right. no. Excuse me? Generally, they don't have to report it. Generally, water, they don't. Okay. So under current law, municipal water systems are also required to issue a annual consumer confidence reports that disclose any contamination problems, the likely source of that contamination, potential health effects of that contamination, and information about the system's susceptibility to future contamination. Um, Correct? They have yes, to do that right. as well. But bottled water companies are not required to make similar um, disclosures to the public. That's true. They currently don't have the authorities to make that requirement. So, Dr. Sharfstein, um, 
there's such a striking disparity in the information available to consumers. We learn about dangerous contaminants in our tap water through broad public announcements within 24 hours, but we may never learn about the dangerous contaminants in bottled water. Did you say that you supported a requirement to have the bottled water companies disclose test results showing contamination above the federal yes, levels? Actually, starting in September, we think mm. that requirement will take effect for contamination that poses a risk to the population. Okay. And is it enough to have the companies, I had the same question with the food, uh, is it enough to have the companies report their lab reports or should there be certified labs that, and should the labs be required to tell FDA when a uh, positive result is found? Um, Isn't that more reliable? I think that, that that's a very important question. I think there are two questions there, the certified yes. labs yes. and then whether labs should be required to report. Right. So for certified labs, I think FDA would like to have authority to require labs if we think that that's important for a particular product. And I think that because of the broad preventive authority that um, the, uh, uh, the this new legislation that's been moving through the House would give, we would be able to do that. The second question of, of requiring labs to report to FDA is a little bit more complex because there's so many tests that are done. Just the positive ones. Just right. No, I, I, I understand. The, the concern that's expressed there is whether or not it inhibits the private sector from testing at all. If they have a good testing program in place where they're identifying and keeping things out of the, the system. You know, should they be reporting every single positive? Which one should get reported? Those are questions that I think it, it's, it's, it's they're a little bit more complex because you could be um, drowning and if you think not just for water but all the different foods, all the different tests, we don't want to inhibit companies from doing their own testing if they have good preventive plans in place. And we want to not be missing the forest for the trees in terms of all the information coming to us. So that, that question of how much to require, where to get it from is sort of a, a more complex issue that we would probably look at it and, you know, in a particular industry or particular situation, like, you know, certain types of tests we probably would want to know because they would be so serious. Mm -hmm. Okay. And earlier this year, um, the subcommittee held two oversight hearings on salmonella poisoning and peanut products that caused multiple deaths and dozens of illnesses. And we learned that the Peanut Corporation of America had received positive tests for salmonella and was not required to disclose them to anyone. Um, and FDA didn't have the access to those results and couldn't access them until people fell ill by invoking another law, the bioterrorism law. And so the same legal loophole applies to bottled water companies. Um, although the municipal water authorities are required to disclose the test results, FDA cannot compel bottled water companies to disclose theirs. So, Ms. Houlihan, if a bottled water company tests its water and finds dangerous levels of E. coli, um, as far as you understand, it's not required to disclose those results to the public? As far as I understand, that is the case. We found a lot of bottled water brands that are posting, 18 percent of the brands that we looked at that are posting full water quality test reports online, and we, we think 100 percent of companies should be doing that and letting people know right away about contamination issues. And, um, yeah, and I'm not really, I, I, even though I made a reference to peanut butter, I'm not by in any way suggesting that this, the water uh, issues is similar. But one important um, lesson that we learned is that sometimes disreputable companies have warning signs long before major problems arise because their systems are faulty. And uh, if federal or state officials had access to that testing data, they might be able to flag small problems before they become big ones. Mr. Das, your organization uh, represents, I think you said, about 75 percent of the bottled water industry. Do you support a requirement that bottled water companies make their test records available to the FDA during routine inspections? We Did do. you say that before? We do. Okay. And I'm sure Dr. Sharfdeen, he already answered that question. Um, do I have any more time? I guess I'm out of time right now and I'll just hold for a second round. Thank you. Mr. Burgess for questions? Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I apologize for being gone during part of, during your testimony and the earlier questioning. Now, um, can anyone tell me the bottled water has a certain standard? What about the, our uh, our cola drinks? Are those bottles held to the same standard as as bottled water? 
So cola drinks are considered food, and they're food, good manufacturing practices that they're held to, but the but um, cola drinks are not held to the bottled water good manufacturing practices, which are sort of in addition to the general good manufacturing practices. To the best of anyone's knowledge, there's no difference in the way any of these compounds would leach out of the plastic into a liquid phase, whether it be water or cola drink. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I don't know if I could, if I know enough to answer that question. I do think that, you know, I think the point that is there is from a, you know, from a food safety perspective, you know, there, there's not a, um, that from a food safety perspective, water has a whole additional set of regulations compared to cola. Um, it really depends on, and, you know, public health, you're saying compared to what? You compare bottled water to cola, it's got a whole additional set of regulations. If you compare bottled water to municipal water, then there are certain disclosure requirements on municipal water that don't apply to bottled water. So it's, it's sort of just your, your vantage point. But from a food safety perspective, you know, there is a whole additional set of regulations that apply to bottled water compared to cola. Well, what about the water that's manufactured and sold with uh, caffeine added to the, to the water? Does that fall under the a food stuff or is that a, is that a water? That's not a water. It's I, not a water. Yeah, I think there's there. I think, um, and somebody's going to tap me if I get this wrong, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> that it's not a water. Yeah, um, we'll probably depends, both hear from them. Actually, right. it depends. I think some of those maybe people may be attempting to market them as dietary supplements and other things. That so, well, what they're actually marketed as is a whole separate discussion. But I don't think it, they're considered a water if you put an extra caffeine in. I see. Um, just really underscores the complexity of 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 the of the process that you have to deal with now. Um, let me ask the GAO on the uh, report that two people to inspect the, the $11 billion water industry <coughs> and four years ago the FDA changed the risk assessment of bottled water from low risk to high risk. So how, the question then comes, how many inspectors should be required? If two are not enough, what, what is our what is our limit? We'll be doing the Agriculture Appropriations Bill this afternoon, which will have the funding for the Food and Drug Administration in it. Um, how do we know that we've got the right number of inspectors so that we can then know that we have the right appropriation attached to the, the FDA? I mean, that's a good question, we don't, and we don't have a precise number just for this segment of FDA's overall responsibility. We have said in designating food safety a high risk area over the past two years that the resources are inadequate to do the job right now. And we have pointed out from a broader standpoint that um, food safety is spread over a number of different agencies. And of those agencies, FDA seems to get the smallest proportion of the budget, yet it has 80% of the responsibility. So uh, I, I don't know whether two is right or four is right or six is right, just for bottled water or we're, or we're just doing a stating a fact that that's how many FTAs are currently dedicated to inspecting bottled water facilities. And, and that, that does not seem to be a uh, sufficient that number? does not seem to be a sufficient number given the, the number of bottled water facilities. Okay. Um, also, you, in your testimony, uh, you note that three quarters of the water bottles produced in the U.S. in year 2006 were recycled. Do we know about the rates of recycle for other beverages? I, I think it's probably friends. similar for all plastic bottles. Okay. Um, with it's, bottled water being a growing share of the market, there are more, uh, more bottles dedicated to water than, than soda percentage-wise. Okay. So numerically, there are more, there's right. more in the in the environment represented right. by the bottled it, water. And this isn't a volume problem, as we noted. It's less than one percent of what's going into a landfill. Nevertheless, they never decompose and they stay there forever. And recycling is a good thing in general. And, and I, I would agree with that. Um, Dr. Sharfstein, uh, in the GA report, the, it states that the FDA currently assigns two people, and yet four years ago the Food and Drug Administration changed the risk assessment from low to high risk. So again, I would ask the question, how, how many uh, inspectors should now be assigned to oversee the Code of Federal Regulations as it relates to bottled water? I'm not sure that's right that we changed it to high risk. Uh, I don't. I think that in general, compared to other foods, we consider bottled water on the lower risk side. Um, I think that there is. Um, uh, there are two issues. One is the frequency of inspections, 
And the other is all the things that go with the inspections. And one of the key things we talked about is just knowing who's making bottled water. And we have a hard time under the current food safety laws really understanding that because by law people can register in paper and the category is called soft drinks and waters. So everyone's sort of thrown in together. So we don't have a very good idea. It, we don't have a, as good idea as we would like to have or we should have exactly who's making it. That's sort of the first step to have like a, you know, solid system. And then we'd like the ability to require preventive plans and, you know, all the key basic steps there. And then you put inspections as part of that strategy. But just thinking of inspections alone with the rest of the way, that it, it's probably going to be um, still going to leave some opportunities for strengthening the system off the table if you're just thinking of it as inspection alone, which is why we like the, the parts of the law giving us access to records, giving FDA the ability to require preventive plans, um, certified labs if we think necessary, other things like that to, or to sort of surround it. Well, then let me ask you a question at the time I don't have remaining, and it's not fair to ask you this, but I'll do it anyway. Um, we're going to vote on the on the agriculture appropriations bill mm -hmm. today or tomorrow. Is the number we have in the bill for the Food and Drug Administration is is do we have the right number there? Yeah, that, that, the president's uh, budget and what came out of committee is a historic increase, and it um, I think there's no question the administration responded very strongly to GAO's finding this to be a high risk and to putting a lot more resources into food safety. And um, if we get that combined with additional authority, I think we will be able to strengthen the system considerably. And, and just for the record, Mr. President, the beautiful campus that they occupy is actually part of the GSA budget, so none of your food safety dollars are going to, uh, to build that lovely campus, which we're, we're also proud of. I'll yield back. Thanks, Mr. Burgess. Let's go another round of questions. Um, Dr. Sharfstein, if we do testing and if they have to report their positive results, uh, once after a while, if you see a continued positive results for E. coli or something from a plant, then indicate you got a problem, we got to get there, or at least increase inspections. Uh, like the PCA, like the peanut butter one with the salmonella, we had report after report and problems, but no one ever received report, no one ever knew at the FDA at least what was going on there. Um, I agree with you. FDA has got to respond to problems very aggressively and has got to be able to follow up with um, manufacturers that aren't meeting standards and, if necessary, shut them down. And, you know, in recent weeks we have taken action against some firms. But, uh, but you wouldn't know unless you received positive results. I mean, unless you received results. Somewhere someone has to, in the FDA has to receive results and look at them, right? Well, it could be that we um, get a complaint and we investigate. It could be test sure. testing that FDA does, and FDA sure. does do some testing, uh, several hundred samples in the last couple of years. So, I mean, we can find out of problems. We could have somebody call us and say there's a problem with this company, and so that leads us to investigate. But then once we find a problem, I think it's important to really follow up until that problem is clearly resolved. Well, how about for those uh, bottlers who use municipal water as their source, wouldn't it make sense to uh, require them to post a link to the required EPA uh, testing results because you get they have to do it once a year? Would that make sense to require them to do it? Well, 25 percent, I think, is the Ms. Hulan, I think, was in your report. 25 percent of the bottlers use tap water. So why wouldn't we just require them to post their website? Right. I think it would. I think it. I could totally understand why that would make sense. Why consumers might be interested in that if the point of comparison is municipal water. The, the thing for FDA is. The standard that we have for putting something on the label is that it would have to be n misleading without it. Right. And so we, we, we can't, you know, we use that to say that, you know, something's got to be there or it's misleading without it. And that's a hard thing to, to put that, you know, to kind of file that in that category. So that's not to say we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't support it, but that whether we could do it under our misleading, you know, authority, that we think is questionable and that it might require a, diff a different look from Congress. That's the misbranding authority you have? That yeah, that the misbranding authority, that the basic, if we were to do it, and this is what I, you know, well, what standard would we have to meet? Correct. And it would be that it is misleading without it. And, you know, we don't require it for other types of foods. We would, you know, would we, would it really be misleading consumers not to have that? And that's a hard standard for us to reach. There may be a better way to, for Congress to achieve that. Uh, Mr. T. Stevenson, if I may, on page 22 of your report, you refer to a poll conducted by the Water Research Foundation that approximately 56 percent, 56 percent of bottled water drinkers cite safety and health as primary reason they sought, sought an alternative to tap water. 
So is it fair to say that the number one reason people are buying bottled water is because they think it's safer and healthier, healthier than tap water? Well, there's, there's that poll and several other, several other research studies that have concluded that, although convenience is a, is a, uh, is a top reason as well. Okay. Well, what bothers me is about the perception that bottled water is healthier than tap water. In many instances, bottled water is nothing more than tap water. The Natural, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, they estimate, as I said, 25% of the bottled water is just tap water in a bottle. Uh, sometimes it's treated, sometimes it's not. So I guess my question is, and maybe Ms. Hulan, uh, you'd be, I think you cited in your report, um, is that accurate, 25% of the bottled water is just tap water in a bottle? Um, that, that's, those are the numbers that are publicly available, and I think it's a big question as to whether it's even more than that, because in so many cases we just don't have the information on what the source actually is, and we found almost a third of all bottled waters have no information on their label. But if they take it from tap water and do something like reverse osmosis or something, then they don't have to claim it's tap water, right? That's right. And there is a provision that requires that bottled waters be labeled as from a municipal supply if they have not undergone any additional treatment. But any treatment that is, according to FDA, quote, suitable, um, allows that bottled water manufacturer to not to use that label and just to call it, this is a purified water, without giving people information on what the treatment processes actually were. Well, let me say, like I said, I, I got this on the airplane yesterday. Um, does Coca-Cola use municipal water for its Desani bottled water? You can't tell from the label. It, there's no information at all on the water source for that product. How about uh, Pepsi there that Dr. Burgess is drinking? They use Aquafina uh, bottled water. Does that come from a municipal source? Aquafina, um, I, we have that label in one of the examples, if you could pull that up. <coughs> Aquafina. Yeah. So... It, on the label, it is labeled as from a municipal supply okay. for Aquafina. It doesn't name the municipal supply, which is what so many other bottled waters are choosing to do. But do, do we know then if they do any further treatment or anything of, of it? Well, so Would it have to be on there? It, it doesn't have to be labeled at all, okay. and we found 44% of all labels don't provide any information on treatment. Mr. Doss, is, if Aquafina was part of your organization, I understand it's not. But if it was, would they have to put on there whether they further treated it other or just put down municipal source would be sufficient? No, they wouldn't. And I think that the issue here is one, uh, maybe a misunderstanding, purified bottled water, which is what Dasani is and what Aquafina is, is not just tap water in a bottle. Correct. Something else happens to it. When, when the water comes in from the municipal source, it goes through reverse osmosis, it goes through UV light, it goes through ozonation, and then in a sanitary conditions is placed in the bottle. Now, those purified waters must meet the U.S. Pharmacopeia standard for purified or sterile water. If it does not, then that label must disclose in that bottle that it comes from a municipal source. So in that case, that water, because it doesn't list that it's from a municipal source, right. meets the U.S. Pharmacopeia standard for purified or sterile water. And that's the big difference here. And that goes to the sourcing of the water. It would be not to list that this source was the Dayton whatever county right. municipal water. That water is quite different than what once it gets in that bottle, then where, when it started out. And, and that's the distinction here. Okay, well, let me ask you this. Let's go back to Isani then. And again, I'm reading the, the label right here on the one I got here. It says, non-carbonated, crisp, fresh taste. Dasani is filtered through a state-of-the-art purification system and enhanced with minerals for a pure, fresh taste that can't be beat. And then if you go on the air side the label, it says, let me find it here. Purified water, magnesium sulfate, potassium chloride, salt. And then it has an asterisk, adds a negligible amount of sodium. Then it has a little cross on it, and it's minerals added for taste purified by reverse osmosis. So to get that clean, crisp taste, are the chemicals they're adding then, magnesium sulfate, potassium chloride, salt, and sodium? 
Yeah, or is it other chemicals? I, I can't speak to Dasani specifically, but it is sometimes done. What happens is the water comes in from a municipal source. Right. It is purified, purified in a different reverse osmosis okay. and other treatments, and then minerals are added back for taste. Okay. So that is what they're disclosing. I, again, I can't speak to that right. specific level label, but in general, that's oftentimes what happens. Okay. Okay. I guess my, my time's up. Mr. Walden, questions? Thank you. Uh, first of all, what what the chairman cited, are those chemicals or minerals? I believe they're minerals, and they've been added for taste, and, and that's why they disclose it on the label. In all order right. to meet the labeling requirements, they are, they're making sure that they, uh, re they are informing those who buy it that this is a purified water with minerals added back. And if they added other things into the water, would they have to disclose that? I believe they would if it, it then is a question of the standard of identity for bottled water, which we have talked about, which specifically says if you are spring water, you have to do this. If you are purified water, you have to do that. So what? The, so there are already rules that say that? They, there are rules that say exactly what you must do if you want to say you are a purified water, a spring water, an artesian water, or well water. All right. If you then add something else to the water, then for labeling purposes, you would probably, and then this is where FDA uh, I, I'm a little, you know, sure. have to make sure we can get back to you on this specifically, but I think in that case, FDA would, would say you need to then make sure you're uh, saying this is purified water with minerals added back, and I think that's it, why they do it. Dr. Sharstein, is, is that, do you know, or your folks know if that's correct? To, uh, get a little bit of help with that question about, you, you, the question is what you're allowed to put back in. Not what you're allowed to put what, back in, but yeah. that which you put back in, do you have to disclose on the label? In the envelope, the answer is There's a letter on that. getting a yes. It is required. So it's already required. If I if I'm a bottler of water and I add, if I go through reverse osmosis and all, the UV and all that, and then I add things back in, I have to put that on the label. That's what my understanding. Okay. I, I want to ask about the, uh, the DHP issue, DEHP, I'm sorry. In your testimony, you state the FDA has decided to move forward on making a decision on DEHP. Can you elaborate on this and tell us when we can expect a ruling? That's actually what I hear if I hear anything about bottled water. It's about this new discussion about what's in the plastic. And this is where it gets a little bit uh, confusing. But, ba but basically, 1990, uh, mid-90s when this was originally done and this particular chemical was deferred. The reason it was deferred is because it had been marketed prior to 1958 and had a special grandfather-like provision as a food additive. And it was thought that it was in the plastic and therefore this provision of the law that we are talking about conflicted with another provision of the law. Um, what is our understanding has changed since that time. In fact, we don't believe that it is being used in uh, water bottles or water caps right now. Oh. Um, and that as a result of that, um, the concern that existed, and I'm, keep in mind I'm a pediatrician and not a lawyer, so I had to ask a lot of questions to understand this, but basically the, the, the legal conflict that was con of concern in the mid-90s is not of concern now and that we can move forward in basically assessing whether or not um, there is a reason to, there has to be an affirmative reason not to have the same standard as municipal water. Um, so, you know, my presumption would be that we will move forward with the standard for DHP like we have for all the other contaminants. What held it up before was really this uh, grandfather legal issue, and I think that that may not apply anymore, and we, can, we can move forward. That's but, what. But I want to get sort of the heart of the matter that matters the people I represent. You are telling me that the plastic and the cap here are, uh, don't have. The phthalate. We 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 have um, um, so in our communications with right. uh, industry. I right. understand. We do not believe that this is a, a regularly used in. Um, Mr. Doss, can you speak well, to this issue? I can. It's my understanding that none of the plastic containers used for bottled water contain DEHP at all. Not the PET, not the polycarbonate, not the HDPE. So none of the bottled water containers used uh, contain any DEHP. However, bottled water, the International Bottled Water Association, for purposes of parity, 
uh, several years ago, prior to 1999, and this goes maybe to the historic uh, reasons that Dr. Sharfstein was talking about, we have a standard uh, in our model code that is exactly the same as uh, the EPA, more for parity reasons. But none of the plastic containers used for bottled water contain DEHP. Did, and, and this may be outside your, well, it is outside your association. Does that same, uh, from your knowledge, does that apply also to uh, Dr. Burgess's Pepsi bottle there and other? <clears throat> Other bottles used for sodas. If they're using PET, which I believe most of the small right. pack is, or if they're using polycarbonate or HDPE, right. which are the three primary uses for all beverage products, then there's no DEHP in them. Right. Okay. So the DEHP issue is really, is it in the water separately just because it's in the environment and that, you know, that that's the reason right. to set a standard. Is, is there a number that you use for DEHP? Like PET is, is, is a number one on it. And that's what this one is here. But there's usually a symbol. Is there a symbol that if you use DHP in a plastic? I'll have to get, I'll have to get back to you. I'm not that we could look. Okay. Can I also add? Well, uh, uh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I, I actually have another question yeah, I want to get to. That but food contact notifications um, that EPA has approved show at least 100 different other kinds of plastic additives that could leach into the water. So there's, this is a problem that's much bigger than DEHP. All right. Good, good to know. Go ahead, Ms. Walton. Yeah, I, I just wanted to get to another point because we, we are so focused, and I realize that's the focus of the hearing is on bottled water and where that water comes from and all of that. But I, I was just saying, so you think if I buy orange juice in a carton, that's made from concentrate, what percent of that is water? It has to be a huge percent, right? Uh, because we're adding water in and then the concentrate. And I, 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 if the issue here is the, uh, uh, the quality of the water and the source of the water going into what we consume, then it seems to me we're, we're kind of myopic here just looking at bottled water because somebody doesn't like bottled water or presumes that it has a higher sort of threshold in our minds about purity. I would suggest that a lot of us drink orange juice thinking that's better than perhaps bottled water because you get other, no offense, but you get other things with it. <laughs> and, and yet I'm thinking 80 percent, 90 percent of what I'm getting in the carton of orange juice, unless it's, you know, fresh squeezed only, not from concentrate, is probably water. And so from the FDA standpoint, do you look at the water? I mean, the, well, that goes into that? I that's mean, part of what makes food safe is the water and they right. have to meet food safety requirements. And, and I that's the same thing you apply to the bottled water, right? Um, it's more we apply to the bottled water because we have additional. Okay. Um, but so I think from what, as I was saying before, it, a lot of this is compared to what? If you're comparing bottled water to other foods or other foods that contain water, it's there are additional um, uh, regulations that apply. If you're comparing it to municipal water, then there's a, there's more disclosure on municipal water than there well, is on bottled water. And well, I, I, it's, it's just your point of comparison. Yeah, but I, I guess the, the question would be, where is that disclosure? I mean, I, I've never even, well, I, I, at least there's something on this label. I'd know where to go. I mean, in my hometown, uh, Hood River, we have it out of a spring, but I don't get a, a notice on my tap or on my water bill or here in the District of Columbia, for heaven's sakes. I mean, what it runs through to come out of my tap is scary. Um, which is why I put a filter on the end and then refilter it and another deal and, you know, all of that. So, anyway, I'm over my time. I, I, I'm done. Thank so you. So, you get from municipal water supply, you don't get notice every year? Oh, we get a letter, seriously. On well, I get a letter. Phone every year. Uh, probably. Oh, okay. I mean, I, and I rush out to my you mailbox read to read it. Okay. And, 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 you know, it's like the sewer notice I get here. It tells me that when it rains, they inflate these uh, inflatable things to keep the sewage from rushing out into the Potomac and the Anacostia, unless it rains too much, and then they deflate them because it caused too much problem, just release it all. But that's a whole other issue. No, we don't want them releasing untreated sewage in our waters, that's for sure. Ms. Christensen. Billions of gallons. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Stevenson, I know that this, in your report the surveys were done in the 50 states in the District of Columbia. Any reason why the territory is not included or, or are they generally not included in surveys done by GAO? No, no particular reason, just the methodology we chose. Okay. But they're not generally excluded? No. Just, just that in this particular? No, a limited amount of time, a limited amount of resources dictated 50 states in the District of Columbia. And Dr. Sharpstein, in your testimony, um, you said that you have broad, FDA has broad authority over food that's introduced or delivered into interstate commerce. So if it's just um, 
within a state or within a territory, FDA doesn't have any uh, jurisdiction, or do you work with the states then um, and the territories? That actually is a pretty broad statement because if the bottle comes from outside the state or the cap comes from outside the state, even if it's just sold within the state, it counts as interstate. Okay. And there's a presumption, I understand, that it would be interstate. Um, but in theory, there's, there might be products that would could be challenged our authority over them, although I'm not aware for water that we've been heard about a problem that we haven't been able to get to either directly or through the states. Okay. Did you want to add something? Um, Mr. Stevenson, we've talked a lot about whether bottled water is safe or healthier, and there's disagreement on that, but there's no disagreement on the fact that bottled water uses more energy to produce and deliver. On page 26 of your report, there's a very, a quite amazing statistic where you refer to a study by the Pacific Institute which examined how much energy it takes to bring bottled water from different locations throughout the world to L.A. And in your report, this is what it says. The Institute estimated that the total energy required to bring a typical one liter bottle of water weighing about 38 grams to a consumer in Los Angeles would typically range from about uh, 1,100 to 2,000 times the energy cost of producing tap water. That's, that's true. So if I drink a single bottle of Evian or Fiji or some other bottled water, which I may not ever drink again, but... <laughs> from overseas, I could be using up to 2,000 times more energy than if I just walked over to my sink and filled up. That's the true. The, the import bottled water accounts for a very small percentage of the total bottled water, but that's true. I see. Okay. Well, that's, that's really astonishing. Anyway, this, the study cited in the GAO report also describes how transporting these bottles can be the single biggest cost. According to that study, transportation energy costs could be as high as 57 percent of the total energy cost for spring water bottled in France, transported overseas by cargo ship, and transported by rail from the eastern United States to Los Angeles. That's correct. Yeah. Your report also has some other findings related. For example, you concluded that most plastic water bottles are discarded rather than recycled. Yeah, we uh, estimate 25 percent so are, yeah. are recycled, so 75 percent are discarded. So, Ms. Hulan, Hulan, um, how did we get here? Why do consumers pay so much, uh, hundreds of times more for bottled water that take thousands of times more energy to produce? We heard some of the marketing claims that are used by the industry, and I think a lot of people are under a misperception that bottled water must be safer than tap water. A lot of people believe that it's free of contaminants. In fact, by law, it's not required to be any safer in tap water. When we tested 10 major brands of bottled water, we found 38 different pollutants, everything from disinfection byproducts to radioactive isotopes to even traces of, of Tylenol and fertilizer residues. So one thing that we need when it comes to the bottled water industry is just more daylight, information for consumers on where that water comes from, how it's treated, what's in it. I think yeah, it's really important for the information to be there so that people can, you know, make a knowledgeable judgment. I, I certainly understand that bottles are convenient, but if we're going to use them, isn't there a better way? Talk going back to the uh, not recycled, but going into the landfill. Um, this bottle of water can get downstairs in our cafeteria. It's bottled uh, over in Virginia, transport, transported just a few miles from here to the capital, and it's biodegradable. Um, so, Mr. Das, you represent the bottled water companies. How many of them are using biodegradable bottles? Not sure exactly how many are and using biodegradable bottles, but I will say that as a general uh, statement that bottled water companies, like other food industry companies, are trying to do whatever they can to reduce their environmental footprint. Obviously, going to bottles such as those is, is one way of doing it. We have made significant efforts to lightweight the bottled water containers. As anyone who drinks bottled water knows these days, they're much lighter weight, uh, which uses less plastic. We also have some of our companies that are using recycled content uh, to less, use less virgin uh, materials. So bottled water um, is trying to do what it can uh, to reduce the environmental footprint. But I think it's important to recognize that bottled water is just one of thousands of food products on the market uh, in plastic. And in fact, uh, we are only one-third of one percent, as reported in the GAO report, 
of the entire waste stream in the United States. So I think that any efforts to reduce the environmental impact of packaging has to focus more broadly on all consumer goods. Absolutely. But thank you. Thank you for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Let's get five minutes in before we have to go for votes. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sharfstein, just to follow up a little bit on what uh, Mr. Walden was talking about on the lawsuit with the phthalate DEHP um, that's been held up, and I think Mr. Stupak referenced it's been 15 years in the making. Um, you are now prepared to issue a ruling in September. Is, is that, do I understand that correctly on DEHP? The FDA is is prepared to, to go ahead with that ruling now, or is that? Um, it's that so there's the question is whether we set a standard for bottled water, and our intent is to proceed with setting a standard for bottled water. And so then that is just a matter of preparing the standard, getting it going. If we come across some reason why this doesn't apply to bottled water at all, we're permitted to make the statement that it doesn't apply to bottled water at all. But it's not obvious to us that there is such a compelling reason at this point. So we would anticipate then going forward and setting a standard. So it's then at that point it's just as long as it takes to do. What's in the law, and this gets, you know, is this there's a 180-day standard in the law, which is that if EPA sets a standard, FDA needs to set a standard um, at least 180 days before so that it can then take effect at the same time as the EPA standard. But with this one, where they waited so long because of this legal thing, that whole that's sort of out the window. It doesn't really apply because EPA standard went into effect so long ago. So really, we would just like to do it um, okay. in a reasonable time frame. And at this point, any any preview, any look ahead as to what that may what the standard may be, or sure, it would just be the standard. If we were to do it, it would be the same standard that EPA has, unless okay, we so had a really good reason otherwise. Okay. But that would be the assumption. Just like we've done for. Almost all the other contaminants, it's the same standard as, as EPA. For a couple of them, we set it lower, like lead and copper. Um, but um, it, I would anticipate that it would be the same, because that's really what the law sets up. And unless we could figure out a, if there were something unique, which is at this point not apparent. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, on the, the issue of the high risk, low risk, uh, apparently there was a, a ruling issued by the FDA in 2005 in the risk assessment. and. I'll get a copy of that, and with your permission, we'll uh, we'll make that available to the consideration of adding it to the record. And then finally, uh, let me just ask a question. Mr. Walden also asked in his opening statement a rhetorical question about recycling, and really this is for, for anyone of the panel, about plastic, uh, the, the compounds leaching out of the plastic in greater amounts in recycled materials than in uh, than in uh, native or, or first run materials so is is that a real concern for us to have is, are there going to be different standards for the recycled bottles or should there be different standards uh, will consumers do consumers need to be aware of any difference between a recycled bottle and a and a first run bottle we looked at FDA reviews of additives in plastic and found that there are over 100 different compounds that could leach out of plastic. So the question you've raised is a very important question and we think not only do recycled bottles need to be more closely uh, inspected and tested with regard to that, but also um, new bottles, what's coming out of the plastic into waters and that kind of testing is not required. Now we fully support the greater rates of recycling in the industry. That's just a smart move overall. Is there is there another secondary use for the recycled plastic water bottle other than recreating another plastic water bottle? Can they be used in building materials or uh, uh, any any is there any other use for these bottles? That's a that's a fabulous question, and I think we're creative enough in this country to come up with other uses that don't involve direct contact with water if that's needed. Okay. Mr. Doss, do you have an, an, an opinion? I don't know anything specifically about the issue you just raised, but I do know that FDA has to clear all food contact packaging materials. So um, if, if FDA clears it, then the manufacturers are able to use it, uh, and they've made the determination uh, that they're safe to use. So we come to Dr. Sharfstein. <laughs> right. the, there's there's got to be a standard of safety. Whether it's recycled or not recycled, there's got to be a standard of safety. And so um, that's what FDA enforces. And um, understanding in light of you know new evidence that comes out about particular substances and the latest science and the different concerns people have, that's FDA's job is to weigh that. 
But at the end of the day, it's got to be a standard of safety, and it's got to apply no matter what is in the package. So where are we right now with the with the issue of recycling? On um, is there is should consumers be concerned about uh, about buying bottled water in a recycled product? And, um, or is it, are you testing these products currently, or, or, or even are there any available? Well, we test the water, you know, um, uh, when we test water, it could be from a recycled bottle or not. But I'm not aware of any uh, special concerns for recycled plastic, and I'm, but um, I think if there are concerns people have, they should share them with the agency and we okay. can look at them. And I guess I don't really even know enough to know whether these recycled materials are then broken down and reconstituted, or do we just simply wash out the bottle that, and, and put a new cap on it? Um, <clears throat> uh, but, but re, I mean, obviously the, the push is to recycle, so we're going to be seeing more of these products in our, on our shelves and in our stores. Well, I, I think you're illustrating why the job is so challenging, because products change different, you know, and FDA's got to be up on them so that we can enforce the same basic safety standards so that the food is protected. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ms. Burgess. Just one last question. We'll close the hearing. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, in your GAO report, you talked about the, and we talked about today, the consumer confidence reports. And in 1996, Congress directed the FDA to assess the feasibility of providing bottled water consumers with the functional equivalent of a consumer confidence report. And according to your GAO report that's released today, on August 25, 2000, FDA concluded that it would be feasible to provide consumers with some of the information contained in a consumer confident report directly on a, a bottle label and, a, and access the remaining information through an address or phone number. Uh, and that's tab number th three there in, in the document. Mm -hmm. is, is that correct? So, yes, that's right. So, Mr. Das, any reason why would your organization object to that, or do you think we should have a consumer confidence report for bottled water? Well, as, as I think was reported in their study, um, they did say it was feasible. They didn't exactly say what was feasible put on the label. I think they were quite skeptical of putting um, some of the uh, contaminants, et cetera, on the label because it would just clutter the label. Now, as I said before, I think that the bottom line for us is that consumers ought to be able to get information, and we think that a telephone number to call the company and request that information is the best way to do it. And almost all bottled waters currently, as well as other food products, have a phone number at least that a consumer could call the company and say, could you send me the information? And that information should be sent. And if it isn't, I'd say go find another product to buy. Okay. So, so you don't mind the phone number, but you don't want any other information? We, we don't. We, we okay. petitioned the FDA to require uh, phone numbers for all bottled water products in 2001, so we support that as a way of getting consumers in touch with the companies to get sure. that information. Mr. Chairman, yeah. I think there needs to be some specificity in what's going to be required Correct. in those confidence reports. Correct. Um, when we were checking labels and websites, it was very difficult to get the kinds of information we would. Sure, your report didn't say send a whole, put the whole report on the bottle. Doesn't have to be on the some label. Some information should be on, and, and there right. should be at least a phone number to back it up if you want further information. Right. That's okay. Right. Well, that concludes all of our questioning. I want to thank all of our witnesses for coming today and for your testimony. The committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record. That concludes our hearing. The meeting of the subcommittee is adjourned. Nice to meet you. Okay. Nice to meet you. Day 10 of the Senate Health Committee's markup of health care legislation continues tomorrow morning. Watch live coverage on C-SPAN 3 starting at 10 Eastern.